Hi, everyone. How's it going? Good. <laughs> Good. Um, so what? I hope everything is uh, fine. Uh, so my name is Bhakti Shringar Pure, and I am representing Radical Books Collective. And Marsha Links Quayle is here, and she has helped co-organize uh, via Arab Lit. And we are calling this event very simply, maybe lazily, Translating Palestine. Uh, and we will discuss, uh, debate, think about various uh, issues that go into the publication, in the editing, um, as well as in the general kind of publishing sphere when it comes to writing, poetry, and so on from, uh, from Palestine. And then we're going to be less heavy and uh, move on to celebrate some books. And we have uh, the wonderful Sonia Nimrer. We have uh, Suchitra Vijayan talking to Louis all day. Uh, and we have, of course, uh, Marsha, who's the translator of uh, uh, Thunderbird series. And then we will also have a pre recorded conversation from uh, celebrating You Can Be a Last Leaf uh, by Maya El Hayat. And which was translated by Fadi Juda, and the conversation is hosted by yet another lovely poet, Jahan Biseso. So I am going to uh, stop this uh, introduction, and I'm just going to uh, introduce our wonderful first panel, which we will talk for about 45, 40, 45 minutes. Marsha will lead the conversation, and I'm going to quickly say who they are, even though many of you who are here, because you already know them. So Marsha links is, of course, the dynamic, wonderful co-founder of uh, Arab Lit. And she also publishes the Arab Lit Quarterly magazine and co-hosts the Bulak uh, podcast. She's a wonderful literary critic, a translator, an editor, wears many, many hats. Uh, and I don't know how she squeezes it in, but she has more hours than the common daily normal human than <laughs> uh, in her day than, than the rest of us do. She's amazing. Uh, then we have uh, Sawad Hussain, uh, who is also a translator from Arabic and is passionate about bringing narratives from the African continent to wider audiences. Uh, she's also a Palestine Book Award judge. Her translations have been recognized by English Pen, the anglo omani Society, and the Saif Kobash Banapal Prize for Arabic Translation, among many others. Welcome, Sawad. Uh, and we are joined by Alice Youssef, who is a Palestinian translator, blogger, researcher, poet, uh, who does all kinds of different things. She's a creative writer and a poet, as well as a translator. And her work can be found uh, in various online venues, including Two Poets Write and Visual Verse. Uh, she holds a master in writing from Warwick University and is a fellow of the University of Iowa's International Writing Program. She is working on her first volume of poetry. Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And Marsha, I'm handing it over to you. All right. Thank you, Bhakti. So <clears throat> in this first panel, I am going to attempt to be both moderator and panelist. So in some cases... <laughs> Myself some questions. Um, the things that I, I would like to cover, and possibly we won't make it through in 45 minutes, um, is pitching, editing, reviewing, public chatter, literary events, and prize culture around Palestinian literature and Palestinian literature in translation, mm. which is a lot to cover in one short space. I wanted to start out uh, by talking about pitching. Um, and and I, I wanted to give a little bit of, uh, ask myself to give a little bit of context about Arabic literature and translation in general in the US and UK marketing. And I think there's a really helpful report by Lit Literature Across Frontiers that's available on their website if you're interested. But basically the background of Arabic literature in translation generally writ large is that um, it was first sort of aimed by publishers at, at making teachable texts. So the first sort of audience and marketing for Arabic literature and translation um, was books for the classroom, for the university classroom largely, but also in some cases for secondary education. Um, so what does this mean for Palestinian literature and pitching Palestinian literature is that sort of the original publishers first publishing 
um, Arabic literature and translation, we're looking for teachable texts. And that most of the courses um, for a, um, a conference we had this summer, I looked up courses where people are teaching Palestinian literature. And of course, maybe people on this call know somebody who teaches Palestinian literature in a wonderful and creative way. But if you look at the majority of courses um, where people are teaching Palestinian literature, um, they're teaching teaching the Arab-Israeli conflict or Israeli-Palestinian literature. So when, when people are teaching Palestinian literature, it is in the context of putting it always in conversation exclusively pretty much with, um, with Israeli narratives and in real Israeli literature. And this is especially true, you know, um, speaking of young adult literature, um, middle grade literature, it's especially true of, of secondary school. Um, and so I wanted to, so with that sort of uh, context, I wanted to ask both of you, um, and maybe we'll start with Sabad and then Alice, about the particular challenges that you've had in submitting and pitching work to publishers or magazines um, as a Palestinian writer or as a translator of Palestinian works. I know that um, Savad, for instance, was, was pitching um, Sahar Khalifa's work for, it seemed like a long time to me anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to know, you know, like, oh, well, they just, you know, when you're pitching something, Maybe they just didn't like it. Maybe they just don't like me. Maybe I'm just not good enough. Um, but is there are there considerations you make when pitching Palestinian literature about what publishers you will or won't reproach, how you write a pitch letter, um, et cetera? So Savad, if you want to start it off. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially to talk about Palestinian literature, which I'm super um, passionate about. Uh, yeah, so I had just made some notes and yes, there have been some editors who have, you know, told me outright that they would or do not want to work with Palestinian authors um, for a number of reasons. Some of those reasons include um, they're not sure how to market them without coming across as too political. Um, they don't want to offend anybody by publishing too many Palestinian authors if they already have one or two in their sort of stable um, and other uh, excuses I have heard is that, oh, because they can't receive a visa. Um, again, we don't want to make the literary festival too political. If we have a Palestinian author, inevitably the discussion leads to the conflict and that's not really literature um, or literary enough. Uh, so these are some of the sort of issues I've come up across both here in the UK and the US, but I will say generally in my experience, and I'm eager to hear from Alice, that UK houses tend to be more open to books written by Palestinian authors than US houses. Um, I do know, for example, of a literary outlet which had done a feature on Palestinian literature and they ended up pulling the introduction um, just a few weeks before releasing the feature, which still did go ahead, but the introduction was deemed to be too political. Although if there was something in the same vein written about Ukraine, I hardly think it would have been deemed too political. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's, and then there are some editors who just, you know, and I don't know if, <laughs> if this is something which is good, but like, you know, Marsha, I told you, I had told you about this, like a specific editor who's just looking for any Palestinian book, like just to support the cause, like they just want a Palestinian author. And hey, don't you have that book about that man in prison? And I'm like, which which book are you talking about? Like, what? what where, why, why is it known as that book? Um, and so I think, you know, obviously, it's great. Like, I want more Palestinian literature in translation. But it's, it's, it's concerning, like, why is it being published? Why are people picking it up? Uh, and then also, I think another factor is that there are a lot of authors who write about Palestine already in English, right? So mm -hmm. some publishers are like, well, why do we need it in translation if people are already writing about it in English? Uh, so just those are some of the sort of um, obstacles I've come up against. But having said that, being a judge of the Palestine Book Awards, the entries each year, which are open globally to anybody in like nonfiction, fiction, poetry, uh, of literature written, you know, about Palestine, um, 
or by a Palestinian, uh, the entries are increasing each year. And this year was the most that we've ever seen. I mean, you know, we're in triple digits. So it's, it's a lot and it's very encouraging. Yeah. I mean, it's in triple digits. Did you read all of these hundred plus books? No. So we have a system, um, you know, where you kind of, yeah, we split them up um, and then have like extensive meetings. Uh, but uh, yeah, okay. it was, I mean, since I started, I mean, I think I've just been on the jury for about three years now. It's, it's really been like exponential rise. And I don't know if that's only because more people are more aware of the awards. So more people are submitting or if there has genuinely been an increase in the publication of Palestinian literature and non like nonfiction and fiction yeah mm. great thank you so much Savad so Alice if um the sort of the same general question of course first of all thank you for having me I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to be speaking at the level of um a lot about this uh, literature and about translation specifically and I would agree with Savad it's a lot of um a lot of times just the word Palestine itself causes a lot of issues. Like as Saad has mentioned, there's a lot of people who do not, there are a lot of people who do not want specifically to publish um, specific people or specific novels, or it's all, almost always, um, as you've mentioned, Marcia as well, uh, connected to having it against something else or against the Israeli narrative. So there is that part of it. And in uh, my reading, in a lot of the kind of older generation of Palestinian literature, it was primarily about that too. So I would understand why at the beginning of publishing, it used to be mostly like things for like schools and for teaching literature and not necessarily reflective of a lot of what's been happening uh, lately. But with also the rise of a different um modes of expression and different ways a lot of the Palestinian uh, generation and the younger generation of authors are writing, I can see that there's a lot more interest that's happening, I think, globally. But as Soad mentioned, it's also easier, especially in the UK scene, um, to look into these different um, types of writing and models of writing and even like different ways of narrating the same thing as um, you were speaking. It came to my mind that like Adania Shibli writes differently. It's a different kind of like Palestinian literature, it still is about Palestine, but does not in a way or necessarily like have all of like, you know, the political, the blood, all of that sort of aspect that a lot of publishers are reluctant, to be honest, to get into publishing that sort of like heavily political and heavily politicized. And it's not just translation. It's also like within the publishing industry itself. And in addition to what uh, Sawat has mentioned, I think she's covered that there are a lot of Palestinians who are writing either in English or in any other like non-Air, I mean, non-Arabic language, um, be it French, be it Italian. And also you have like um, German. There's different, mm. there are different voices that are already being published in those languages. And I feel like, in a lot of instances, it's easier to get that translation movement between these two different like um, Eurocentric languages other than being with Arabic, because you add to all of the challenges you have. There aren't many, um, let's say, uh, that well conversed in Arabic or like Arabic is a difficult language. Let's, let's face it. And writing in a literary um, sort of voice also increases the difficult it also is challenging to carry it from one language to the from that language to the other so it's sometimes I feel like as a language the also the translation movement from Arabic not just Palestine has been slower in comparison to the other languages and other like other books like you can see a lot of books they come out and then next the, the year or a couple of years after you have it while if you look at Palestinian literature specifically and a lot of like literature from the Middle East region, it's generally very, very, very slow. And it gets more complicated when it's Palestine because of, you know, the political tag that's on it and how um, difficult and how problematic that might seem once you get that book marketed or once you see it in, in the public, uh, public space and public domain. But what I've also seen, uh, I think Sawad has also mentioned that, touched on that briefly, that there is a lot of like literature that ties in with like solidarity or with a lot of the movements that are with or going towards that so sort of um it 
kind of goes both hand in hand. There's, um, once there's anything that is on a political level that's happening and then um, you see like a lot of collections of poetry coming out and kind of in response, not necessarily in a sense in response, but it increases the chances of having that translated or bridged between the different languages. And I recall a lot of books that came out from uh, different UK publishers, uh, different poetry volumes in translation. And I don't know why I feel like also because it's immediate and it's shorter and it's easier. Poetry is sometimes easier and you can find more of it translated versus Palestinian fiction. I think it also has to do with marketing and with the challenges of different um, what kind of audience is receiving that sort of uh, book towards the end. Perhaps also the Mahmoud Darwish halo or his like great impact in literature has led a lot of people into wanting to translate more poetry but i think also because it's immediate it's shorter it's easier it's easier to market somehow it can go into a collection you don't have to translate the whole thing so it it's kind of makes it a little bit easier i guess or i see it more um available if we can say so so i think these are some of the ideas of why that might be happening at a level and I think so it's already covered a lot of the actual challenges of submitting and pitching and speaking about it I would just say the translating poetry can't be easier yeah I, I mean, I'm with Marshall <laughs> no yeah it depends it depends I guess I think because I write it I find it easier for it's um, easier yeah well whenever we're dealing with poetry at our blitz I always skip it to Nashua because she also writes poetry but uh, for me uh, anyway so if we talk about so we're talking about Nashua editing all the poetry um uh, to to speak about editing so as again this uh, ahead of this Palestinian um literature conference in July in Berlin i was thinking about editing in palestinian uh works and um and something that i've um observed sort of as an as an outsider um it seems to be this sort of process sometimes when, when publishers are bringing out a book by a Palestinian author of something that I was calling um, bulletproofing. So in particular, I was thinking of, and sorry if Ra is on this event, sorry in, in advance, but um, he already knows that when he brought out um, Atef Abu Saif's um, uh, memoir, uh, the drone eats with me. I think it was called. There were all these footnotes in it, and uh, uh, you know, kind of like proving that that this memoir, which is an experiential memoir of his of of war and, and being bombed in Gaza, uh, was sort of true. And I guess um, I, I felt the same way. I don't know where. Oh, when I was reading um this new book mother of strangers that it just felt like bulletproof like somebody had been through to just like make sure that um everything is explained and 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 in particular i was like surprised to see that um when when <laughs> when the word you know jew was used in a particular context that was maybe unflattering they said yehud and made it italicized um and other contexts where it was more of a flattering portrayal than they had Jewish or Jew, which which was like I didn't quite understand the the um, well I I couldn't quite rationalize the, the the reason behind that except that you know sort of taking taking care not to offend in the in the editing process, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to know Savad what I, I imagine that your editing. Eagle, for instance, was pretty lovely. My editing process, you know, we both with Interlink and with um, University of Texas Press was 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 beautiful. But I just wonder if you have any thoughts about sort of the the editing process as publishers are shaping um, a book, a story, a poem for for reception and translation. Specifically from Palestine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. I mean, like, as you, I was very lucky with Siegel, actually, because both Bab Saha by Sahar Khalife and um, Dance of the Swedes, uh, Scorpion by Akram Musallam, 
um, are, are highly political in different ways. Um, and Siegel was very, very light with their, with their edits. I mean, we had some scenes which I think, not I think, I know with other publishing houses. Well, I don't think they would have picked up the book in the first place, to be honest. I mean, Siegel is uh, like vanguard in that respect that they're not worried about the, the politics of a text. And so there are there are definitely political scenes in, in the book um, and they were left untouched, which I was very happy about to let it stand as, as it is. But uh, I'm keen to hear from Alice what her experience has, has been uh, in terms of being edited and, and what her relationship with editors have, have been like, yeah. Uh, my relationship with editors have been uh, bittersweet sometimes because in a lot of instances, because English is not my first language, most of the editing, the heavy duty editing goes towards the final text and the grammar and all of that, the connection between the original meaning and what it means and not mostly what has been um, taken out of translation. What I normally do is I try my best not to over annotate the text and make sure that every single word carries across. It's more of like what the context dictates towards having um, that text uh, being uh, or coming to life. Mostly recently, I've found myself working a lot with theater, which makes it a lot less like it's e less easy for people or harder, let's say, for people to like edit pieces of it out because it's going to be performed live or it's it has already been performed live. So they can't really take out chunks. So they kind of take it as it is. But with literature, um, the, the, uh, if I as much as possible, I try to stick to not having a lot of footnotes and a lot of things to keep the spirit of the text. And I try to jump off the basically embedded subtext of the text rather than just put it out there the way it's been done. So it's, it's been kind of both good and, good and bad. I haven't had anything major um, that has been edited out or um, taken, but I totally understand what you um, can relate to with regards to a lot of sections or sectors be being cut out of the text or changed. And eventually, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a publisher's choice, but I think if the process is made in consultation with the author, that makes it easy. I don't know how easy it is for the author to receive the fact that their book is not kind of what they intended because a lot of the times the authors are guarded about what they write and they're really precious about what they've put out there but I think if it's done in in a lot of like if it makes sense for that to be allowed maybe we're able to forgive that a little bit I'm not sure but when in a lot of times I can tell that there have been a few edits because someone isn't scared of offending someone else or is scared of offending or is scared of the reception of the book itself or the piece that is performed or the poem that it's too much and it just it would it wouldn't be accepted by different um by the english speaking audience uh, for example i was i always heard a lot of comments that there's a lot of, of palestinian poetry that has um a lot of like physical aspects to it like blood bodies that sort of things that are like too gore for the non um, Arabic speak like it I heard the terms of it works in Arabic but it wouldn't work in English and I'm like why there have been like there's a horror genre that has literally torn like limbs in it so why wouldn't it work when the context is like a poem about war or something or a text about war so it always like is a light bulb moment in your head that keeps you thinking of why is that acceptable for certain type of genres and certain type of fiction and literature and not in the others so that's wow. always Mm. Thank wow. you, Alice, so much. Um, so to like sort of rush onward, as I was just like <laughs> checking the time, and I love the <laughs> that people are writing. Continue, or they, they show up on the screen. They're wonderful. Um, to talk about reviewing, I just want to say, Marsha, can you talk about it <laughs> a little bit? Um, so so um, <laughs> I am really interested in, in the sort of the history of reviewing, the recent history. Um, now, Mahmoud Darwish was very late to come to English uh, versus French, where he was, you know, a really big deal in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, Mahmoud Darwish was translated. Um, there were a couple collections in the, in the two collections in the 70s and 80s that I was able to find. 
there were, a, you know, a few works by um, uh, Ghesan Kenefeni and, and a few, uh, few other Palestinian writers in the 70s, 80s, and 90s translated to English. What I, what I found interesting about the, the reviews that I read is how afraid of engaging the text they seemed. Um, so there was a 1981 review of Dennis Johnson Davies' translation of Derwish, and the, the reviewer asks, is it then propaganda? Um, and he answers, no, it's not. But like the, the idea that he needs to form it all around, is it propaganda? Mm. There's another um, where uh, he says, all the major figures in Palestinian literature, Darwish, Kanafeni, and Samahat Qasim, are all Marxists. Um, which is a very like strange thing to say versus engaging with the actual poems themselves. Um, a, a September 2000 Publishers Weekly review of Palestine's Children by Fina Fanny. Um, the scores are described as militant like the author. And those are some sort of um, uh, whatever. This is, this is where we come from. These are our, these are our ancestors in, in reviewing as we approach it now. Um, I would say that um, many things have changed in that um, you know, many of the reviewers who are coming to literature now have, have a more you know, delicate view of, of what literature is, a more interesting view, a more nuanced view. Many are Palestinian themselves. However, um, I, I recently saw a talk by Sophia Brown where she looked at sort of the range of criticism of Raja Shahada, who is one of the few um, Palestinian writers who's been widely reviewed in major publications in, in, in English. And, and it was all of this very sort of narrowing uh, um, um, and, and, and turning, uh, you know, everything into, you know, making, you know, an angry man kind of thing, which is, which is not, um, sort of what his literature is about. And that I wanted to say before I turn it over to you guys too, that um, uh, also if you're reviewing as, a, as, a, as, I, as I do, and if you work as a journalist and as a freelancer, um, there's also, you know, this thing hanging over your head that something you say about Palestine can get you fired. I, um, I can't remember whether it was a month or two ago, Deutsche Welle, who I used to write for, and, and <laughs> longer, sent out a post <laughs> uh, after they'd fired several Palestinian uh, journalists with, without giving reasons why they had fired them, which was presumed to be their statements on social media. And they, the, the code of contact, the, um, code of conduct said in the email that given Germany's historical responsibility for the Holocaust. We are committed to Israel's right to exist. Um, uh, I, you know, you, to, to, to write for them, you have to sign on to this special obligation towards Israel. Um, so this is, so, to, so, so I used to write about review literature for, for one of the Deutsche Welle publications, um, including Palestinian literature, but sort of the, they're sort of pre-narrowing who, who, who is going to be a reviewer of, of literature? Who is going to choose which books to pitch to them? Wow. By, by making you sort of sign on to this code of conduct beforehand. Um, and, you know, you know it, I guess it's just simply their, their own sort of, um, then if they cut you off, well, you, you violated our code of conduct. You know, it also says you... No racism, sexism, etc. But, but this is what they put front and center when they sent out the email. Um, and and so I wanted to ask, what? <laughs> sorry, to go from there. What your experience of of reviews of um, um, Palestinian literature for good? And, and I mean, I've also had some fantastic experiences. Um, and a Mansour, uh, you know, mostly Nazara uh, is is. Is Palestinian. Her engagement with with uh, Sonia's wondrous journeys was beautiful. Um, mostly, it was the Palestinian critics who really, um, really deeply engaged with the literature. And uh, so, Alice, this time we'll go to you first. 
All right. Uh, so yeah, with, with regards to review, I can see a lot of what you've mentioned. It happens uh, in a lot of uh, instances, but personally, I haven't had any major issues with that because I chose to start doing the reviews from a criticism point of view and through like um, social media platforms. Specifically during COVID, I, I had a lot of spare time and I was just doing um, a lot of reviews in, on not just Palestinian, but also international um, uh, literature that I was reading, a lot of things that I loved, a lot, a lot of things that I was questioning. And uh, I have not been banned yet. So I would uh, say that I'm really lucky in that regard. But I think in a lot of instances, when you are in control of the text that you are um, submitting, and with regards to the publishing industry, when you look at it, it's no longer just about magazines and journals a lot of I, I see and read a lot of reviews over blogs and um, that sort of like the new modes of publishing where you kind of self-publish it so you don't necessarily self-censor in, in, in a sense it gives you more freedom to choose your basically choosing your medium helps you with the final outcome of the review but I would understand that in a lot of uh, publications and in a lot of instances a lot of it are uh, you come along the terms of we're not interested um, this is not relevant this is too um, for example focused on a certain uh, aspect that we don't want so you get to see both sides of it depending on what um, kind of medium you're choosing to publish into and uh, uh, of course it's really unfortunate when the whole literature of a whole nation is, is like put under the rug just because it might be offensive to someone or it's always labeled sensitive and that sort of situation because you're it kind of washing over a lot of like really rich texts and a lot of stories that really merit to be heard and a lot of voices that have been not only writing the older the 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 basically just the resistance and the others that side of palestine but you see a lot of the new texts that are going into more the social aspects the it's just like any literature that exists out there and really merits to be reviewed for it to be picked up more specifically in cases where there's a lot of resistance towards and there are a lot of ch challenges into carrying that into english to begin with so you feel like you're at odds with this where you really want more highlight to be drawn onto that, but at the same time, you also understand the baggage that comes with it. Uh, but I think a lot of um, the new modes of like social media has been helping a lot. Um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, Medium, that all of these different blogs have been also helping with the review process. And I think um, as much as we think of them as new publishing mediums and not everyone wants to take them as seriously as, you know, quote unquote, the actual physical publication of a book, but they also have, um, they have power to affect, and I think that that is helpful, and specifically in the case of Palestine. Mm. So, yeah, I just, what's your experience been like? Yeah, I was gonna um, jump in and say. So, I guess positive and maybe not negative. It's kind of like lack of maybe just kind of a, a neutral. Is so the the positive is that like uh, Daniel Shibley's book Minor Detail received amazing coverage, right? Um, and really engagement with it on a liter literary level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was when it was long listed for the Man Booker. I remember listening to like radio shows on, I think it's BBC, um, you know, just them sitting and talking about it and, and people, I thought it would have been shortlisted. It sadly, sadly was not. Um, I felt that was, you know, highway robbery, but anyways. Um, so I think that was a really exciting moment um, when I saw it being reviewed in a lot of, you know, like the Guardian, the New York Times, um, and uh, no one was sort of shying away from the material in the book either. So I thought that was a, a, quite a seminal moment, to be honest, because I haven't come across any other sort of um, current, you know, text uh, written by a Palestinian author that has received that sort of, um, like, has been fetid, especially in translation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and with regards to the books that I've translated, I think, like, th they've always been positively reviewed but that's generally as you've said marchers because either the person reviewing it is from the middle east or they're palestinian um and so i really appreciate those those reviews but i'm just saying they're generally for like smaller outlets like it's you know they haven't been picked up any big ones so 
I don't know if that's just because like of the timing. One of them came out like Baba Saha came out during COVID, um, mm-hmm. you know, Passage to the Plaza. And sorry, I said it was the Dance of the Sweaty Scorpion because that's the direct translation from the Arabic title. But the publisher, we actually went with the title um, The Dance of the Deep Blue Scorpion. But this was not because of any sort of um, political issue. It was just that Siegel had another book out actually with the word sweaty scorpion in the title um, in, in coming out in the same year, which was really odd. Um, so they're like, we can't have two sweaty scorpions um, being released at the same time. So we went with the dance of the deep blue scorpion, which Akram Musalam was very happy about. So uh yeah for me i mean as i said with with minor detail you know i thought that was a really exciting moment and really encouraging and and i thought maybe would spur other publishers to take on palestinian literature you know for example i know maclehose press here in the uk is publishing huzama hubayib's um which is coming out by uh, translated by kay hennigan who was her translator and won the bunny paul prize with um velvet and Hosama was recognized for the Najib Mahfouz Prize. So I think um, I know that they picked it up because Hosama had like been, you know, given all of this um, attention for her work uh, because I pitched it. But I'm just really excited to see it come out in translation and see how it's received. Right. Uh, but um, there was no issue when they picked it up. There was no concern about it being a Palestinian book or anything. They were engaging with it to their credit as literature and, and the mm-hmm. writing is what they fell in love with. So I think there are some sort of, you know, bright, bright lights. Here yeah, it's def- I, I, I mean, it's definitely different. Uh, I mean, I think there are challenges now and there were challenges then. But yeah, I mean, Adania, for instance, mm, has been trying to push this Samir Azam collection of, of, of short stories. And um, because in the time that Samira was writing, uh, there were not translations particularly of a work by, of short stories by, by women. And short stories, I think, are the most difficult to publish. Translated um, so, by Rania Abdurrahman, right? The one that's coming out by Yes. Rania. Yes. Yes. Awesome. yes. <laughs> yes, so we finally will make it happen. Um, oh, and hello to Kay. Hey, Kay. <laughs> for it. <laughs> okay, so Bakti tells me that we don't have long left. So now that you're talking about prizes and awards, I, uh, I want to just um, skip ahead to, to that and what you think um, are the effect of, of prizes and awards and prize culture, what has been the effect of the Palestine Book Award. Um, I, I would just say... Marsha, do you have any thoughts about this? Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Ghassan Zakten, who I admire a lot um, and, and was also published by Siegel, his, um, his prose works uh, in beautiful translation by Sam Wilder. Uh, and maybe one of, one, one of them was translated by Fadi. Uh, okay, I don't remember. But any, in any case, his poetry was translated by Fadi. And um, when he, he first was meant to go on, on tour in the US in, in 2012, he was refused a visa. Penn and the ACLU both had to intervene. And as I remember it, I couldn't find this though. Um, they, were, they particularly said Israeli writers wrote letters of support for him. So you should let him in. Um, as if, you know, Hassan needs in particular letters of support from Israeli writers in order to get into the United States to do his book tour. Eventually he was let in. Then the next, the very next year, he won the Griffin Prize, which is Canada's sort of, I believe one of Canada's biggest prizes, um, certainly for poetry in 2013. Again, he was refused a visa to go pick up his award. Um, And this was again overturned after um, a, a social media campaign against this, uh, this policy. And at the time, Fedi had said uh, it's a policy set in place to humiliate, silence, and marginalize Palestinian voices and artists in the English speaking world, particularly in North America. Um, and, and I just, I, I don't know, like, what was, did, did this Griffin Prize uh, ha- have an effect? Uh, I, I think, you know, definitely Adania has, you know, from, herself the power of her work or, um, winning awards I don't know 
ha has managed to to get into this literary space. Um, but is, is it awards? What what is it that that makes this this change? Either one of you. I'd love to hear from Haas, but I can't believe I forgot to mention that minor detail was brilliantly translated by Lissy Jacquet. So that I just need to rectify that. Yeah. Um, so yes. Alice, your opinion on award culture. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, so with the uh, Griffin Prize for uh, for Hassan Zakatan's uh, book, it was very well received, I must say, in Palestine because I was <laughs> here and I was following the whole thing that was happening before I started moving across countries and seeing the effect of it um, abroad. I think once it any Palestinian major poet or author who's alive and who gets a prize, there's a lot of willingness to start pushing for their work to be translated, at least on the local level. Uh, but I don't know how well that is received on the international uh, scale because, you know, Hassan did win the Griffin Award, but then we didn't see a lot following or a lot of basically a lot of people jumping to get his books published again. So I'm always wondering, is that... Um, are the prizes good, well enough, or good enough for 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 the publishing world to recognize these voices? And as much as these different poets and authors have put out their work, it has been translated. There has been a lot of hard work towards getting that book over. So, if prize culture doesn't get you a head start, like what would give? What would be the incentive towards having more recognition at that level? And as you've mentioned, so other than his books, she's also been doing a lot of work, and also her being based outside of Palestine, I think, also helps in cases of travel and being able to show up to these things in person and engage with your audience and being able to sign and to receive your award at the minimum, at least, mm. it replicates that sense of like you really appreciate having the award. So there's also the complication of actually being able to physically go and receive the award and go physically meet an audience which I find in a lot of instances it goes against like what you've put out there in a literary scene if you've done so much work for it but then you can't really or sometimes for political reasons uh, be there that also takes back from you being engaged with the work and with the audience but I think it's still a great aspect of having a lot of voices being highlighted throughout these different prizes because it goes to tell that they really measure it to be translated and they read and their translators really need to be credited and really need to have all of of that light shed on on their work too because it's not easy to carry a book into a different language and that credit shouldn't be taken back because of the political tag that's around it i think Great, thank you so much. We I don't know if we have any time. We did have one question, which was, um, do we have self-translating Palestinian authors? Um, and um, <laughs> I know Atif Abu Saif wrote this uh, um, this memoir when the drone eats with me. Rewrote it in English. Um, I'm struck. Ibtisam Azim. She was translated by her spouse Sinan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, tr I'm, I'm struggling to think um, if, whether there are self-translating Palestinian authors. There, there must be, uh, but nobody actually leaps to mind at the, at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are many Palestinian translators and many Palestinian authors. I just don't know. I cannot immediately think of who is translating themselves. Mm -hmm. Savan, you gonna help me out here? Okay. No, I can't think of any. I just want to like throw out Mazid Maruf jokes for gunman. I know he's not self translating but as in another title that was engaged yes, with on, a, yes. on a literary level and not as just part of the you know politic political machine. Um, so yeah. Does Amir translate his own work? I mean, I've seen him translate it by Yasmin and mm. and um, by. Uh, okay, oh. sorry. We'll 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 uh End it. will save me from myself here. <laughs> yeah, I'll we'll just stop here. It's a, it's a tough uh, it's a tough request. I mean, the self translating, you know. It is. It is a big, is a big <laughs> thing. Yes. I'm sure it happens. Um, all right. Well, I'm just here to say thank you. That was uh, absolutely wonderful, and I uh, want to transition us. 
to a conversation between Jahan Bisesso and Maya Abu Al Hayat. And then, uh, Marcia, you will come back to chat with Meg about the Thunderbird series. So for now, I will move to the next. Thank you all.